UCC and I'm currently based up on Orkney um, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. I started my journey with WDC back in 2017 so after graduating university I spent eight months as a residential volunteer at the Scottish Dolphin Centre at Spey Bay and that's where I worked with Katie on Shore Watch for the first time. But before we get started I'm just going to let Katie say hello and introduce herself as well. Hi everyone, as Emma said, we're really excited to be here this evening chatting to you and it's great to see so many folks signed in, so that's fantastic, thank you for coming along. Uh, so I'm Katie Dyke and I have worked for WDC for seven years now on the Shorewatch project and I have the rather lovely job of managing the Shorewatch volunteers and the Shorewatch sites, which takes me to some fantastic coastal communities in which I can spend several hours, um, uh, hours on end surveying for cetaceans and I absolutely do love it. Well, back to you Emma. Awesome, thanks Katie. Um, so Katie and I are both going to, to be uh, presenting to you this evening um, and we're going to give you a short introduction to WDC. Uh, we'll chat a little bit about the Shorewatch project that we've already mentioned and then we're going to talk to you a little bit about what species you might be able to see from the east coast of Scotland. Um, so thanks so much for signing in tonight to listen to what we've got to say um, and also thanks to the Scottish Seabird Centre for having us along um, to chat to you guys about the work that we do. So Whale and Dolphin Conservation is a global charity and we are dedicated to the conservation and welfare of all whales, dolphins and porpoises. Now these are known collectively as cetaceans, so if you hear Katie or I using the word cetacean um, throughout tonight's talk we mean a whale, a dolphin or a porpoise or all three. Um, so we're a global charity and we're working to protect cetaceans across the world. Um, and we've got offices in the UK and also further afield, so in Argentina, in the United States and in Germany. And our vision at WDC is a world where every whale and dolphin is safe and free. And there are four key aspects to our work in protecting whales and dolphins and trying to reach that vision of a world where every whale and dolphin is safe and free. And these are to end captivity, to stop whaling, to create healthy seas and to prevent deaths in nets. And we do this through a whole range of work, for example, um, through campaigning, through research, through education, uh, our Adopt a Dolphin programme, and also through outreach, for example, the Shore Watch project and other engagement events as well. Next slide. Thanks. Um, another slightly newer aspect of our work is on the green whale. And I just want to talk about this very briefly because I think it's really, really cool. Um, and also because WDC are going to be doing a lot more work on this in the future. So whales actually play a really amazing role in supporting the marine ecosystem and also helping to mitigate climate change. And I'm just going to briefly explain how this whale pump works using the infographic on your screens. Um, so whales feed at depth in the ocean and when they come up to the surface to breathe they do massive poos. So whales are obviously very large creatures which means they also produce quite a lot of waste um, and these poos release lots and lots of nutrients at the surface of the sea. And these nutrients are really, really good for phytoplankton. And phytoplankton are tiny plant-like organisms that float around um, the surface. And phytoplankton is really important because through photosynthesis, it absorbs about 40% of carbon from the atmosphere, um, which is a huge amount. Um, these floating rainforests of phytoplankton produce half of the planet's oxygen. And then this whole process creates a thriving ocean habitat and it also helps support fish, fish populations as well. And another amazing way that whales help combat climate change is when they die, um, and we call this whale fall. So when a whale dies, their carcass will usually sink to the ocean floor. Um, sometimes they do wash up on our beaches. I'm sure some of you have seen pictures before, but most often um, they'll sink to the, the seabed. And that's where carbon is then stored for thousands of years. Um, the whale carcasses on the seabed also provide um, a vital food source for species um, and a home for up to 200 different species on the ocean floor as well. So whales really are ecosystem engineers for the ocean and that's why it's really really important that we don't just protect the ones that we've got at the moment um, but we allow them to thrive as well and that will go some way in helping us combat the climate crisis. We live in a really exciting part of the world um, and we can see up to 21 different species of whale and dolphin without even having to leave the UK. 
Um, we currently have about 25 specific shore watch sites around the coast of mainland Scotland and also the Western Isles. Um, and this year we're expanding into the Northern Isles as well. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about shore watch. Uh, Shorewatch is a citizen science programme, and that means that we recruit local volunteers to carry out 10 minute cetacean surveys around the coast. And over the years, we've trained over a thousand people. And at the moment, we've probably got around 200 active volunteers, so people that go out watching uh, quite regularly. And the main aims of Shorewatch are for us to produce a really reliable and consistent data set so that our data can then be used for meaningful conservation management. And we provide training to all of our volunteers on how to correctly identify different species of cetacean and also all of our volunteers follow the exact same methodology and that involves watching out for a continuous 10 minute period from a specific shore watch site. So essentially shore watch allows communities to get involved in conservation at a local level and also the dedication of our volunteers collecting this data across Scotland um, allows us to gather really good robust scientific data and that can then be used to ensure the long-term future of cetaceans. And this year, very excitingly, we're expanding Shorewatch into the Northern Isles. So I'm said mentioned at the start, I'm based up on Orkney and it's going to be my job this year to set up a selection of sites, um, six on Orkney, six on Shetland and one on Fair Isle as well. Um, the coastal areas around the Northern Isles are really important habitat. And we get sightings of orca, harbour porpoise, rizzo's dolphin, and even just yesterday, a fin whale was spotted from shore. Unfortunately, not by me. Uh, I moved to Orkney just over six weeks ago and I'm yet to spot any cetaceans. So I think I'm currently a bit cursed. Um, but Shorewatch is different to simply just recording casual sightings because we're also monitoring the effort. So basically, um, we're also recording when no cetaceans are present. And by recording watches, whether or not animals are sighted, we're then able to say how often a particular species will occur in a specific area. So rather than just simply saying we saw bottlenose dolphins 62 times in 2020, we can actually monitor the frequency of those sightings. Um, so just to give an example of why that's useful, um, we've got one of our sites up on the north coast of Scotland and we have a very dedicated volunteer who watches very consistently year round up there. And he doesn't see a lot throughout the year. He has a lot of no cetacean days. Um, however, he does keep watching out all year round. Um, and then around about September time, he starts to record an increase in harbour porpoise sightings and abundance. And that indicates that during the autumn, that's a really important habitat for the harbour porpoise. And there's lots of different examples um, across our shore watch sites for different species. And the reason we watch from selected sites is so that the data that we collect is consistent and comparable. So when we select sites, we take into consideration our internal policy priorities. So for example, if there's any areas that we might like to see a marine protected area designated in the future, um, but also accessibility, local facilities and also local partnerships. So other organizations that we might want to work with as well. And a lot of these sites are located right on the tops of cliffs or on sticky out headlands. So we get a really, really good view out to sea and that gives us the best chance of seeing or being able to spot what's in the water. And another key objective of Shorewatch is to raise awareness of what a great place Scotland is to see whales and dolphins wild and free and best of all from the shore. So we don't have to interfere with any of their natural behaviors. And we support all of our volunteers to become ambassadors um, and supply them with branded t-shirts, leaflets, and we help build their confidence um, to speak with members of the public about whales and dolphins and about the work of WDC. And the collection of this Shorewatch data can help us better understand the movements of coastal species. It can help us highlight hotspots and areas of importance and help us uh, focus our conservation efforts and also inform consultations and decision makers on a more local level. So it's really, really important for the work that we do. And we share all of the data that we collect on a national database called the Scottish Living Atlas. And we work closely with other marine organizations such as the Sea Watch Foundation and the Hebridean Whale and Dolphin Trust. And we also make our data available to students. So for example, they can use it for their dissertation projects. And we use our data internally to help advise policy and support the establishment of new marine protected areas and also to help advise developers as well. 
but best of all, we increase people's chances of seeing whales and dolphins in their natural habitat. So our volunteers on average do around 7,000 watches every single year across Scotland. And on average, there's usually around two and a half thousand sightings and 11 different species of cetacean. Um, and I've been lucky enough to see nine different species of cetacean in Scotland over the last few years. Um, I'd say most of those were uh, directly related to my involvement in Shorewatch. So I've talked a little bit about how Shorewatch and how the collection of this data can help us protect whales, dolphins and porpoises. And I just want to quickly illustrate that with just one example, although there are so many to choose from. So the picture that you can see on screen now, that's of a Rizzo's dolphin. And Rizzo's dolphins are seen regularly in coastal waters around the Outer Hebrides. Um, they're also sometimes sighted from the North Coast and from Orkney and Shetland as well. Um, but our Shorewatch volunteers on the Isle of Lewis spend a lot of time enjoying incredible sightings of Rizzo's dolphins from our watch site at Chimpin Head. And Chimpin Head overlooks the Minch, which is a really deep trench of water. Um, and the team at Whale and Dolphin Conservation also head out every single summer and they take photographs of the Rizzo's dolphins off the coast of Lewis. And over the years, we've built up an ID catalogue. So each individual dolphin can be identified from the different nicks and scars on their dorsal fin. And this photo ID evidence that we've gathered shows that we're seeing the same individual dolphins every single year. And that coupled with the Shorewatch data that our volunteers collect throughout the year, so not just in the summertime um, when the weather is nice, um, those two data sets coupled together, that provides the evidence that Rizzo's are seen all year round. Uh, they're sometimes seen with calves and they're sometimes seen exhibiting feeding behaviours. And this data was recently used to, to evidence that the coastal waters around the Isle of Lewis are a really, really important habitat for this population of Rizzo's dolphin. And we were therefore delighted last year when the Scottish Government finally designated the area as a marine protected area. And that was specifically for the Rizzo's dolphin as well. So unfortunately, this past year, we've not been able to get out shore watching at all. Um, and that's because of COVID and lockdowns. We all share equipment and stuff, and that's obviously not been able to happen. Um, and we've therefore lost a whole year of effort-based data collection. So some of our very, very lucky shore watchers do live near to the coast. And during their daily exercise, they would still report any casual sightings. Um, so in 2020, we still had just over 1,800 cetacean sightings um, from these casual reports. And the next few slides are gonna show uh, where we saw particular species in 2020. So firstly, we've got the bottlenose dolphin, um, and you can see the bottlenose dolphins are sighted throughout the year very consistently, um, a bit more prevalent in the summer months. And although um, looking at the map as well, although there's a small population on the west coast, most of our bottlenose dolphin sightings happen on the east coast of Scotland. Um, and I think Katie's going to cover that in a bit more detail later on. Moving on to the harbour porpoise. Uh, this is a species that we see all around the Scottish coast um, and also all year round as well. And again, we had a few more casual sightings in the summer months um, in 2020 as well. I've talked a little bit about the Rizzo's dolphin already, so we shouldn't be too surprised to see that all of our Rizzo sightings in 2020 were on the west coast of Scotland, uh, mostly from the Isle of Lewis, but a few off the coast of Skye as well. Um, and Rizzo's were also seen throughout the year, um, but there was a large peak in sightings in August as well. And finally, our common dolphins, again, more often sighted on the west coast of Scotland than the east um, and seen throughout the year, but more frequently in the summer months. And I just want to um, remind you that these graphs are showing casual sightings. So these summer peaks that we're seeing could just be down to people spending more time in the sunshine outside and looking out for whales and dolphins. And that just highlights how important our effort based shore watches are. Um, where we watch throughout the year and we're then more able to see how often cetaceans are seen by comparing the presence and also the absence data as well. So this picture was taken by one of our Shorewatch volunteers, Ronnie Mackey. So thanks for letting us use your picture, Ronnie. It's a great shot. And this was taken from our Shorewatch site in Kinghorn. Um, so for, the, for those of you um, who are based in Edinburgh and the Lothians, we unfortunately don't have many Shorewatch sites at the moment in your area. Um, and this will probably be your closest Shorewatch site. 
So if anyone listening tonight is interested in finding out more about Shorewatch or attending a full day's Shorewatch training session, if you live near Kinghorn and you'd like to watch out from there, then please just do get in touch. Uh, we do have an online training session coming up at the end of the month, uh, but booking is essential. So I've just popped our email address on screen there. So do get in touch um, via the email um, if you are interested. And that's all from me. So I'm just going to hand over to Katie, who I think is going to delve into um, a bit more information about what species we might actually be able to see from the East Coast. Wonderful, thank you, Emma. Um, I'm just gonna apologize in advance. It looks like my camera um, is flickering on and off. Uh, so if it is causing anybody any problems, uh, do just message into the, the chat and I, I will turn it off for you. Um, it's more important to see uh, the pretty pictures than my face anyway. I'll just make sure that nobody is replied. Okay, um, so yeah, thank you, um, um, Emma. So now I am going to talk to you about how you can go about watching for cetaceans. And I'm going to give you a few tips on how to ID different species, along with a bit more information about our resident population of bottlenose dolphins and an insight uh, to a couple more campaigns that WDC are running at the moment. <clears throat> Emma has already highlighted uh, where our shore watch sites are, but even if you don't have a shore watch site close to you, that shouldn't stop you from going out and looking for cetaceans. It's a hugely rewarding experience, and you can still input sightings to different organisations too. So if you're new to watching from Marine Mama, for new to watching for marine mammals, it's a difficult one to say fast, uh, here's some tips that you might find useful to get going. So before heading out, you might want to think about the location of the site that you're going to start surveying for whales and dolphins. You might want to pick a spot that has a really good vantage point that you can see loads of sea and that is, is quite a good high spot. Headlands are always a good spot to go and survey from because they give you a lot of height and they're especially good as they are areas where different bodies of water meet. It might also be worth trying to find out if there's been historic sightings in that area too. You'll also want to pick a good day, good weather day. Think about the season. Summer sometimes can be a better, uh, as Emma pointed out with our casual sightings last year, summer sometimes can be better with more frequent sightings, but exciting things always pop up uh, when we're not expecting that. So the winter can be a good time to go out surveying as well. And uh, as many of you from Kinghorn will know, a nice sighting on a wintry day is one, a fantastic thing to brighten up your day. There's nothing better than getting freezing cold on the headland, looking for stations and then heading home or somewhere warm to warm up with a cup of tea. And that's another good thing. It is a good idea to pick a nice spot to survey for whales and dolphins where there might be a nice coffee shop close by to, to warm up in. You do want to think about the weather as well. So be kind to yourself and give yourself the greatest chance of seeing things and go out when it's nice and calm on the sea, when there's little wind disturbing the water so that you can really clearly spot something. And even a darker day when the sky is gray and makes spotting things, um, does make spotting things a little bit easier due to the contrast of the dark seas and the dark skies and dark animals. You're gonna to wanna to think about what to take so most good watching spots are really exposed, breezy areas. So do be prepared for all seasons. And I would suggest watching with binoculars. Uh, some, some, when we're watching from the shore, some animals can be very far away and binoculars can really help you see different behaviors and leave you feeling like you have had an incredible encounter. We use marine two Opracron binoculars, which are seven by 50 binoculars. And this means they magnify by seven and they have a diameter of 50. So it lets a lot of light in. I always also tend to take a thermos with me um, and some biscuits in case I can't find a coffee shop. I must admit one of my favorite spots to go and just watch outside of, of a shore watch site is up near Durness, uh, where I can stop in at Cocoa Mountain and get the best hot chocolate that there ever is. Um, you'll always probably want to take a notepad for those field notes and an ID book um, will also come in handy uh, to verify a sighting. So when you start out looking for whales and dolphins, it can be a bit overwhelming looking at an open sea and thinking about how you're going to spot anything. And so some cue, uh, using cues can help to get your eye in. 
When I go out and look at the, the sea to hope to see some cetaceans, I always look out for these cues. So our first thing I look for is a um, flock of, of birds, as these associate with fish, uh, which is the food for cetaceans. I'll also look for disturbance on the water, a wave breaking in a different direction or a slick on the surface or even a splash might let me know that something um, has just surfaced or something is just about to. And so I'll take my binoculars and have a good look around that area. And those of you that have been lucky enough to see Barney, the humpback from Kinghorn, will know that looking out for a blow of an animal can also help you pinpoint where the animal is. So if you are lucky enough to spot something, uh, you are most likely going to want to figure out what species you've seen. And so as Emma said, I've seen around 10, 10 probably 11 species um, from the shores of Scotland. And there are 21 species that can be seen from the UK waters. So telling the difference can sometimes be a bit challenging, but there are ways to make things easier for us to ID what we're looking at. And so I asked myself a series of questions to hone in on the areas of the animals that I want to um, help me determine what species I'm looking at. So first off, I'll look at the dorsal fin and I'll ask myself, where, it, where is it sitting along the back of the animal? If it's in the middle of the animal, I'm gonna think it's maybe a porpoise or a dolphin. If it's further back the animal, it might be a baleen whale. And I'll also look at the shape of the fin. Is it hooked or is it pointed? Is it curved or is it triangular? I'll also look at the head. Is there a beak um, and what shape is that beak? I'll have a look at what color the creature is and if there's any patterns or any scarring. And if I'm seeing a blow, what shape is that blow? Is the animal active? Is it shy? Is it social? Is it solitary? How big is it? Um, is it big? Is it robust? Is it slim or slender? And the answer to all these questions will paint a better picture of what I'm looking at in order to help me ID what species I'm looking at. So let's test this out with this picture. So what do I see? I see here a very triangular fin. I see a dark gray color. I see the fin in the middle of its back. I see quite a small animal. And if I was seeing it in motion, I would probably see a low rolling surface pattern with very little extra behaviors. And the animal is solitary. And all these clues are pointing towards this species being a harbour porpoise. Oh, I've gone on a bit too far. Uh, in comparison, looking at these creatures, what do I see here? So I see, um, if I'm looking at the fin, I see a curved fin in the middle of its back. I see a very grey animal with a white underside, a short stubby bottle-like nose, and a large robust creature. And you can clearly see it's very active it's clearly social, it's breaching, and all these are leading me to say that I'm looking at a bottlenose dolphin here. So watching for cetaceans, um, it is really important that patience is key and really don't get disappointed if, you're en if you have endless days looking out at nothing but sea. It doesn't reflect your skill um, if you're not spotting anything and do keep going. Some of our most active watchers that have seen loads of things now didn't see anything for years, years. So I quite like this image. Um, you know, what we imagine that we'll see when we get out to the coast is breaching and flipping animals. Um, and a number of the times that we get out there, we are looking at, at, at empty seas, unfortunately. Uh, but they all lead up to making well and often watching even more addictive. So the bottlenose dolphins we're lucky enough to see on the east coast are a resident population and currently standing at about 210 individuals. There are other resident populations around the UK, the biggest in Wales, um, and there's smaller populations in the west of Scotland, the southwest of England. Um, but these east coasters are the only in the North Sea and they are pretty big, coming in at almost four metres. And this map shows the range of the East Coast bottlenose dolphin. They were once named the Murray First dolphins, and now they're called the East Coast dolphins, as you can see how far their range is, going all the way up to the Caithness coastline and the northeast of England. So this image shows quite how far these dolphins go. So Spurtle is a unique dolphin who stranded in Cromarty some years ago. Um, and before she was able to be refloated by British Divers Marine Life Rescue, she suffered some really bad sunburn, hence the scarring that you can see here. 
Um, this scar is healed really well and the scarring is reducing every year. But this scarring also makes her really easy to spot. And there's some really something really special about being able to spot an individual that you know some of their life history. I've seen both Spurtle and Mischief together out in the Murray Firth and it was pretty exciting to, to spot them and know that I knew a little bit about their history. So uh, Spurtle is often seen with another iconic dolphin, Mischief, who was once thought to be a female as he was often seen with calves and in 2019 they both went on a little journey and they were seen up in Caithness and photographed in Thurso Bay and then they split up and Spurtle and some others ventured off to Ireland for a number of months and weren't seen in the Inner Firth for a while to the disappointment of many of us that watch in the Murray Firth and then mischief was seen around the Netherlands. So this kind of travel probably has been happening um, for a number of years within this population, but because these two are so easy to spot with Spurtle's um, scarring across her, her dorsal flank there and Mischief's distinct nick in the base of his dorsal fin, it's really easy to spot these guys. And so it's really easy to track uh, their journeys. And because they're so iconic, people are looking out for them. And so other citizen scientists and community members with cameras can easily, easily spot them and take photos of them for us. So as this previous story suggests, dolphins are really sociable and they're fun loving animals and form really strong bonds with family and friends. And this photo shows two adult males, Scoopy and Prism. And this is one shot from a series of photos of these two dolphins breaching out of the water. And breaching like this can be a form of play as well as a way to strengthen bonds with each other and to communicate. This show photo shows an adult female rainbow and her calf indigo. Babies are born throughout the year after a, gest gest uh, sorry, a gestation period of one year, um, but we do tend to see a peak in births around the summer months and autumn months. When, the new when born, the newborns are approximately one metre in length. Um, and it's often witnessed that the females and um, relatives to the, to the pregnant female will help in the birth by bringing the newborn up to the surface so that newborn can take its first breath. And the young stay really close to mum for many years and they're not fully weaned until about 18 months old. You can spot a newborn quite easily uh, by these fetal folds that you can see here in this picture. And these are formed from when they're squished up inside their mum. And this photo is, an adult, um, is of an adult female named Tallfin and her calf, who looking at these fetal folds were pro was probably only about a day or two old at the time the photo was taken. And you can see how wrinkled up those folds are. So dolphins are quite opportunistic feeders. They eat salmon, herring, sardine, cod, haddock, octopus, sprats, sand eels, but this varies between the seasons and the years and depending on the food availability. Food is concentrated around the coasts in the rivers around the summer months, so that's why we tend to see dolphins particularly more regularly in the summer months than the winter months. And dolphins don't have molars like us, so um, they don't chew their food. They swallow their fish down whole. Um, and in good feeding spots, you can see them doing this thing called fish throwing to ensure the fish goes down the right way and in one, in one whole movement in the right direction, head first, as you can clearly see in this picture here, a terrified salmon looking down the throat of a big bottlenose dolphin. So dolphin use, dolphins use echolocation to find their food and they make clicking noises which are sent out into the ocean and these bounce back off of objects like fish. And I will just send, I'll just click play here so you can listen to what these clicks sound like. So dolphins use these echoes to produce a map um, in their brain of the surrounding area and so that they can close in on the fish that they're hunting. They also use this process to navigate and echolocation allows them to hunt and find their way even in really dark waters. And because dolphins are dependent on sound to communicate, to feed, to find their way, it's even more important that we're very aware of the effects of human sounds on their ability to carry out these natural behaviours. 
It's not just spot-on-nosed dolphins and porpoises that we can see from our coastlines. We've recorded numerous species from the shorewatch sites, and Kinghorn has recently become quite famous for humpback sightings. Humpbacks have been sighted over the winter in this area consistently for a few years now, and this year was no expected Ex exception. Barney, it was the local, locally famous humpback whale, was spotted in January this year and he has been brightening up many people's lockdowns with full breeches and tail slaps. And his story um, is another example of a fantastic citizen science project making waves and I know Lindsay is, is on tonight so I just wanted to shout out to Lindsay McNeil who is a citizen scientist who runs Scottish Humpback ID project and she does fantastic work successfully matching humpbacks uh, between uh, where they're seen in Scotland and wider across um, in Norway and further afield. And she was again successfully able to match one of the humpbacks seen this year, Barney, with a previous sighting on, west, on the west coast seen 173 days earlier in August. And this spot in, on Col was also made from a Kinghorn resident. Uh, Barney was last seen late February, and I've been told that the last day that he was presumably seen was amazing. And members of the uh, Marie, the Force of the Firth Marine Mammal Group, were able to track the whale all the way along the coast until it turned out into the North Sea. And so many people from further afield um, and east of Fife also got to be able, were able to see the whale as it passed them as well. So he was surely brightening up many people's day through uh, February and January. So there's lots of other locations across the coast in which humpbacks have been seen. And I've been lucky enough to see them from numerous spots, including my hometown Lossy Mouse, um, Spay Bay, Cullen, Aberdeen, Dunnet Head, Duncansby Head and Chumpen Head. And when I was young and knew I wanted to work in this field, I had um, glorious images of working in far flung places in warm waters of Australia. I had no idea that I could see such incredible creatures in my own backyard. But the sad news of an entangled whale and the north coast of England brings it home again, just um, the devastating impacts that we can have on these animals. And in fact, a study using a variety of data, including shorewatch data, um, a number of years ago, showed that our waters are so full of creole lines and other material causing bycatch that our waters could actually be unsustainable to hold a healthy population of humpback whales, predicting that the entangled remain entanglement rates would be so high. Each year in UK waters it's estimated that thousands of porpoises, dolphins and whales suffer and die in fishing gear. And our new Goodbye Bycatch campaign seeks to highlight uh, this urgent action that's needed to end bycatch. It really doesn't have to be this way and following Britain's exit from the EU and the creation of new fisheries laws we are lobbying Holyrood to adopt stronger measures to protect dolphins, porpoises and whales from fishing gear and to make the seas around Scotland but also the whole of the UK a safer environment to be. Bycatch in fisheries is the biggest single killer of whales and dolphins worldwide but the UK could be the leader in this and making a change <clears throat> um, and so if you're interested in finding out more about that campaign you can ask us afterwards but also it'd be great if you could follow this campaign on our website whales.org um, and also uh, the hashtag is goodbye bycatch. So just to touch on a campaign that we're relaunching at the moment, our Rude to Intrude campaign. So did you know that it is um, illegal, uh, it's a criminal offence to disturb whales and dolphins? It can be an unforgettable experience seeing cetaceans, but when we are out on the water, um, whether it be a boat, a kayak, a stand-up pedalboard or a jet ski, we do need to be really careful not to get too close. Whales and dolphins need time to rest, to feed, to socialise, to reproduce, all to stay healthy. And if we get too close to these animals, we can disrupt um, and even drive dolphins away from the place that is important to them. So our Rude to Intrude campaign aims to raise awareness of disturbance and help people understand the steps that they can take to mim minimise their impact on whales and dolphins when out enjoying life on the water. 
And we are relaunching this campaign because we fear that the, um, the nation will be staycationing again this year. And this may have increased impacts on marine mammals as people are flocking to the coastline to enjoy water sports. And so we've relaunched this campaign in the last few days. So fingers crossed, you've seen some social media around it and you've seen it picked up in the national and regional press. But to support us, um, please do look out for our social media posts and, and share, share, share. Um, thank you very much. Um, and that brings me just to show you this short video. Um, it's only a minute, so I hope it doesn't buffer for people, but if it does buffer, it's only a minute. Um, and it just will give us a minute to immerse ourselves in some beautiful footage of supping and cetacean footage. Hopefully that worked for most people, but as you can see at the end of the video, if you go to our website whales.org forward slash disturbance, you can find a lot more information and we've got more videos um, that go into more detail about how to report an incident if you see anything and what to look out for um, at when you're, um, if you see a disturbance of any kind. Uh, we couldn't show all the videos because uh, not all of the audio worked unfortunately when we were streaming it earlier. So as communities, we do have a lot of power and we can make our voices heard. And I have seen this time and time again where communities are standing up for the wildlife that they watch. And I often remind myself of these examples to help me, um, examples to help me uh, feel that things are not as doom and gloom uh, and to know that we all can take action and we can all make a positive difference. And us being out there watching and recording and being the eyes on the sea uh, when other monitoring isn't possible is the first step to taking that action. If we didn't record it, if we weren't monitoring it, if we weren't shouting about it, it might go unnoticed. And so we have so many examples of our shore watch volunteers reporting disturbance cases, educating others, um, uh, monitoring local developments and keeping an eye on activities to ensure it's all within licenses, commenting on consultations, writing to MSPs, and the list goes on. So we all can make a difference. And I'm pretty sure that is where I'm ending. So thank you very much for having us. Um, and we're very happy to open the floor for any questions you might have. Bam. I'll stop sharing my screen. Great. Thank you very much to Emma and Katie for that fantastic talk. Wonderful to hear about all the variety of work that WDC is involved in and all the fantastic hours that have been put in by Shorewatch volunteers around the coast. Really quite fantastic. Um, so during the chat, the team have been putting in links to the various campaign sites and the WDC page. So please feel free to scroll back through the chat to pick up those links. We'll be trying to post them throughout the Q&A as well. So keep an eye on the chat box. Um, we've also had some great questions coming through. So I'll start at the beginning. Uh, Alex asked, is the material you're presenting available through your website tonight? Um, if he is, or oh, she referring to um, the videos, um, then absolutely. Um, the data that we presented is um, also open source on Nash, on the Scottish um, Living Atlas. Um, if there's anything more specific that he. he um, thereafter, um, then they feel free to get in touch. Uh, but a lot of the information are surrounding our campaigns and our work and um, finding out about different species is definitely well represented on our, our website. Yeah. 
Great, brilliant. And also we will be releasing a recording of tonight's talk on our YouTube channel as well. If you want to pick up any of the facts and figures and videos, again, it will be, it'll be on our YouTube channel. Uh, thank you. Uh, Richard has asked, are there any plans to expand the watch sites to Southwest? For, for instance, in Cornwall, where I know there are lots of keen watchers. We would absolutely love to take uh, Shorewatch, not even national, but global. Um, but sadly, we just have have to um, limit ourselves a little bit in terms of capacity. So there are only four of us working on the project. So there's myself and Emma that do the um, community outreach and the training of volunteers um, and the monitoring our shore watch sites. And then we have Alice who runs our data side of things and manages the data. So we're, and then um, our uh, manager, Sarah, who oversees the whole project. And so we're quite limited in terms of the capacity and to open more sites, we want to um, take serious consideration in whether we can actually um, have the capacity to work with that data, but also manage and support volunteers. What's slightly different to um, for Shorewatch compared to other projects is that we really want to support our volunteers. So we are asking for data to come from volunteers that are fully trained and so we're not just collecting kind of ad hoc casual sightings the data that we're collecting is all from trained volunteers that are thoroughly supported through our project and so if there's any queries on the data that's coming in we can go to those people and ask them so that means that the um the data that we're getting back is really strong and consistent data, but that also means that it takes a lot of time to support our volunteers. So we want to offer trainings and then continual trainings to keep people up to speed. We run site visits where we go and visit all the sites to make sure that volunteers are following the right methodology. We also want to make it quite an inclusive environment and a network of volunteers that people are connected with each other. Um, and so we run socials. And sadly, we are based up on the, the north, the northeast coast. So I'm based up on the northeast in Murray. Emma's based up um, on Orkney. And I do a considerable amount of traveling around um, the north coast and the west coast of Scotland to support our sites. And we just don't have the capacity to send me down to the southwest, unfortunately, which I would love to. I'm from the southwest, you probably can hear. Um, so having shore watch sites around the southwest would be fab, uh, but that would need, uh, we'd need to expand the project and maybe get more people on board. And unfortunately that's funding and money dependent as well. But do watch this space. Maybe sure watch will take over the world at some point. <laughs> ah, absolutely. Fabulous. Um, Linda has asked, I have sponsored Dolphin with WDC for a while now. My Thank current you. one is Rainbow, uh, which WDC swapped for my original one, Moonlight, as they lost sight of her. Has she ever reappeared? Oh, I'm actually not the best person to ask about the adopted dolphin. Sorry. I think um, I know I Katie. I can okay. So um, I, you might remember in Katie's presentation where she talked about Spurtle and um, mischief being sighted in the Netherlands and also on the around about the Isle of Man. So Moonlight was also sighted, um, one of those dolphins that was re-sighted from the Isle of Man as well. And she's become more of a resident around the Isle of Man. Um, and she also has a young calf at the moment. Um, and the calf's been nicknamed Starlight by um, the local people from the Isle of Man. So she's actually doing quite well. <laughs> Which is oh, nice. right. <laughs> Fantastic. Abandoned us for the Isle of Man. I see. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Um, Kate has asked, do you have any live stream cameras that we can watch online? No, we don't, unfortunately. We do have a camera at the Dolphin Centre, and I think we did live stream it at one point, um, and it wasn't very reliable. Um, we also had um, acoustic sounds there that we, we streamed as well, and we struggled um, because of the shingle and the sound around Spay Bay, the natural sounds. Um, but yeah, sadly, we don't. But I do know um, that there are some live streams um, of other projects that we support. So Orca Lab, um, they have a live stream. Um, it's not the UK, it's Canada, uh, but you can you can spend hours sitting watching Orca and listening into Orca as well. I don't know if you know of any more, Emma. I'm afraid not just the one at the Dolphin Centre, which, um, as you said, yeah. isn't actually online at the moment. But yeah, it's not online. But if you do get to visit the Dolphin Centre, you can play around with our cameras. Obviously, sadly, due to COVID, we are not 
fully open at present, but when we are open, you can come and play around with the cameras. They are good fun to play around with. Um, uh, also, not cetacean live feeds, but the Seabird Centre on our website, we do have live camera feeds out to the local islands in the Firth of Forth. So we've got a camera on Bass Rock, the Isle of May, which you can watch puffins and, and gannets uh, who are currently on the islands now preparing for the breeding season. So it's always lovely. So that will be on our website. It might potentially appearing in the chat, uh, a link to that. So keep an eye out for that if you want to get your marine environment hook. <laughs> um, lovely. So a few other questions have come through in the meantime. Let's have a look. So from Grant, Grant has asked, what is the best thing to do if you are on the sea in a canoe or similar and a whale or dolphin approaches you, as in stop moving or move away slowly, etc.? That's a really good question. Um, I'm an avid um, seagoer, so I, I paddleboard a lot, I surf a lot and um, kayak. So yeah, I have come into those situations numerous times and, and dolphins have surrounded me in the past. Um, and it is very easy to get overexcited and one, not know what to do and two, get too excited and approach the dolphin. So the main thing you want to not do is to uh, is to approach them. So I would really suggest if you are on a kayak, I know it's difficult in terms of currents and things, um, but stay on your steady course, stay where you're going. Um, don't change direction to try and, and approach them or chase them. Where possible, stay about 100 meters away. That's not always gonna be possible in terms of the current, but also if they're approaching you, um, then they might be heading straight for you. I've had that um, a few times on my paddleboard. I'm just going in my direction that I'm going at, and they've actually changed their direction to come and suss me out. So it's about, the thing that I will always remember is it's, if they want to encounter and engage with you, it should be their choice. We shouldn't be following them. So just figure out what direction they're going. Let them go on their way. Um, if they come to you, great. Um, don't follow them. If you are in an area where they're feeding or anything like that, um, probably try and get out of that area to give them that space um, and don't, don't stay too long. So 15 minutes max when you're interacting with, with animals. Hopefully that was, was clear. Sorry, I waffled on a bit there. No, not at all. Clear as day. Um, a question did just appear as well in the chat. Somebody, Simon was asking about the use of drones. Um, Simon asked, do you use drones to have a good look? So with that, because I know drones are used in research, but also yeah. in capturing your footage. So if you want to expand on drones a bit. Yeah, so also with drones, um, we, you can cause a disturbance with drones. So you should follow the same method with using drones. So don't approach them too closely. So still stay about hundred meters away. There's a new um, campaign regarding seals at the moment. And I really like their hashtags. They've got um, hashtag use your zoom. Uh, so if you are using drones that do use that zoom and stay a good distance away from the animals. But yeah, as you said, Charlotte, drones can be used for for um, research. If they are being used for research, they will need to have a license. Um, and if they do get that license, uh, then they may be able to approach closer. Um, and drone footage can tell us a lot about um, individuals. I know there's drone footage of porpoises around Shetland and it's showing um, larger aggregations where we wouldn't necessarily be able to judge how many individuals were there, particularly for those species that are not as um, kind of gregarious as bottlenose dolphins. You've got porpoises that don't surface so much, so it's very difficult to estimate numbers there. But with drone footage, you can have a good look at what numbers you're seeing. Um, and also you can see a lot more behavior from the air. So we've seen large aggregations of where uh, individuals are interacting and mating and breeding. So again, can pinpoint some really important key habitats um, for these species. Also photo ID, you know, you can, if you can get drone footage alongside an animal, you can get some really great pictures uh, for photo ID. But yeah, all of that research, you'd have to have a license to conduct that stuff. Great, thank you. Uh, a few more questions coming through, but is it okay to keep asking? Uh, yeah, sure, go for it. Three minutes left, plenty of time. Um, Teresa's asked, um, I once heard that one can see dolphins quite close from Dundee, which is the closest shore watch site from Dundee, please? 
Can I leave Emma to answer that question? <laughs> yeah, I think it's um, probably Tory Battery in Aberdeen. I know that's still still quite a distance from Dundee, unfortunately. Um, and then if you're travelling south at all, it would be the Kinghorn site in Fife. Um, so yeah, no plans at the moment for a shore watch site in Dundee, but watch this space. As Katie said, we're trying to take over first of all the UK and then the world. Um, so fingers crossed. <laughs> um, but yeah, also when we are allowed to, um, when movement is um, is allowed more freely, we're still being very cautious with shore watch at the moment. Um, like Emma said, we haven't resumed shore watching um, through this the, COVID, the pandemic, um, but we're opening up our shore watch sites again at the end of the month. But we're going to be moving very softly, and we're encouraging people to stay within their local shore watch sites. But when travel restrictions loosen and we feel a bit more comfortable about traveling around, um, Shore Watch usually is a network of people that do move around different sites. So if people are going on holiday, um, they can link in with our Shore Watch sites um, and watch from those spots and meet up with other volunteers in that area. But we might have to move a bit slowly on that due to the pandemic. Great. Well, that was actually the last of the questions that have appeared in the chat. So thank you very much to Katie and Emma for presenting tonight. Um, as we mentioned, the COVID pandemic has uh, interfered with a lot of work and has also caused some financial troubles for environmental charities like WDC, like Seabird Centre. So um, the links to fundraising pages uh, have been put in the chat. So we'd very much appreciate any contribution that you could make to both causes. Uh, adopting animals for both, both the Seabird Centre and the WDC would be absolutely fantastic. And also we've uh, popped in a link to a feedback form as well, which would be great to have some information on how we're doing with tonight's event we're hoping to run more in the future so if you have any any comments you'd like to pass on to the team feel free to complete that survey but that's it for tonight just a very big thank you again to katie and emma and uh, yeah look forward to hearing more about the dolphins around the coast <laughs> thanks very much everyone have a nice thanks, evening Katie.